I'm Brian Smiga. I work for Pritzker Group, a family office in Chicago and LA, very active in private equity and venture. And I've, we've got a great panel here. We're going to talk about how to relate to and then raise money from family offices. Why do we say relate to? Um, you know, these guys agree with it. They're, they're, they're going to introduce themselves in a minute. The problem GPs always make is they ask a few token questions at the start of the meeting of the family office, and then they launch into how great their fund is. And you, you really need to get to know the families, because everyone is different. And it may take you years to raise money from a family office, but if you form a relationship in that first meeting and you're truly helpful, uh, you will have a friend for the rest of your career and a potential LP for the rest of your career. So this is really about how to create a conversation and get to know and find the synergies with families as you get to know them. And we're going to go from there. So, no, I'm sorry, is the script slide yet? No, no. I don't think we have a slide yet. Yeah, I was looking for the welcome screen. I'm sorry. For All right. The, yeah, let's go Great. On. All right. So uh, I'm Brian Smiga. I advise Prisker Group since 2011. Uh, $7 million family office with 40 people working in private equity and 16 in early stage tech. They seed funded the, the fund I co-founded, Alpha Venture Partners, which is a growth fund. We invest in growth tech series C and later. Natalia, take it away. So what's happening in the marketplace? Uh, family offices are increasingly building professional teams to do and make their own direct investments. They're increasing their allocations to private and alternatives. This should be a great opportunity for private equity and venture GPs. But how do we make the match? And how do we find alignment? And I think it comes from being curious and asking the right questions. So the first question to ask is, where is the family in its evolution of forming a direct and or a private and alternative investment strategy that may dovetail with what you do? And it, families are going to evolve over decades how they build their teams and their private investment practice. It took Pritzker Group, for example, 15 years to get to the point where they raised their first outside fund, which they just did last year, a $2 billion fund. But they were humble, and they built their own practice quietly for 15 years, and benchmarked themselves against Cambridge before they went out and raised money. So you've got to try and figure out where the family is in its evolutionary path. So let's ask our panelists this. I'm going to start with you, Simon, then we'll flip back and forth as who gets to go first. So since you came from China and Natalia only came from LA, uh, why don't you go first? Tell us where your family is on its evolution in making its own direct investments and or partnering with GPs. Yeah, yeah. Right now, our family started out uh, almost 100 years ago now, uh, so it's now in the third generation, uh, by doing what was um, very common in those days, which was being an Asian trading group, uh, so trading things between Asia and the more developed Western markets. So 
They made a lot of money doing international trading, and the second generation moved into real estate. And now the third generation is moving into technology, uh, uh, particularly in the sustainable space. Uh, so the, the, the generation uh, that is inheriting the money now, not only in Asia, but uh, I see globally, is, is more interested in the sustainable space, less interested in pure uh, capital growth. Uh, and I would say a large part of what we do these days is related to sustainability. Where are you in your evolution? And, and what's the name of your family office? And, and, and where would you say you're, you are in your evolution? So the name of the family office, Selco Family Office. Um, my father resides uh, in Switzerland, so operation is Swiss based. Uh, and uh, I'm second generation, so it's uh, started after the fall of the Soviet Union, so in the early 90s, so it's uh, relatively new. Uh, and especially what's going on in uh, Russia and a former Soviet Union involvement, oligarchs, it's, it's a humongous change. So I think it's very important to stay um, focused on you know, uh, having your own principles, not bend the rules, because a lot of people made a lot of money by bending the rules or doing it the wrong way, but um, obviously you know a lot of the people out of the games already. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the important things is to stay in the game is to really uh, you know, play the right way. I would say that's, uh, that's uh, advice coming from so one of the most important things to establish besides where the family is in its evolution of its private and alternative strategy and team is what generation is making the decisions. So in our case here, we have a second generation up and coming, Natalia, then we have a third generation. We both have, in both cases, we have family members. And so understanding the differences between what is this new generation that's rising in the case of Natalia or third generation um, let how does generation affect how people ought to work with you Natalia and then your from son? Well I think in general you know right now they say that about 70% uh, of gender, uh, generational uh, transfer will happen in the next uh, 10 to 15 years so as uh, so, uh, family often is uh, shift to the new generation, a lot of focus is shifting to uh, higher growth because the family preservation is uh, changing into more family creation between, because the money is spread between the heirs, so there's less money to invest, and they're taking more you know, private deals, uh, venture capital deals, uh, and that's a really a very common trend to see, and uh, considering that the trend will continue uh, shifting to a newer generation, it will continue shifting more to high percentage um, investment being put for private equity. Like for instance, I think in 2017, private equity was about 22%, and it uh, returned to 18% uh, return on private equity in 2017, so uh, not, not bad. So people are definitely focusing that direction. So I think uh, what's important between generational is because exactly sustainability impact, uh, because millennials and younger generation, they're more focusing on doing social good rather than just making money. So it's a very important factor to consider when you're approaching the generation. Okay, third generation family member? Well, we, we work with a lot of uh, first generation families in China because a lot of the money is, uh, is still in first generation. So mm -hmm. um, although we're third generation, we work very closely in most of our partners with the first generation. So we can see the big difference between the first and the third. The first generation generally likes to focus on stuff they know. So right. It would be much less global. So much more focused on where they make the money, the industries they make the money in, where they feel comfortable. Decision making tends to be with uh, who they want to make the money in the first place rather than uh, committees. So even if they appoint professional managers, ultimately the decision tends to be with the, uh, the person that created the whole thing. It's very different when you get to uh, something like the third generation where they have professional managers in place, uh, the family is much wider now, Founding member is normally uh, gone, uh, and rather than having uh, family committees sitting there, they actually appoint genuine professional managers. So it tends to be a more global thing. They move away from the original country where the, the money was born. They diversify in terms of uh, industries, uh, and uh, they may well do a whole range of different asset classes. So it, it looks much more like uh, a U.S. style family office uh, mm -hmm. that you're seeing. Yes, they're going into funds, they're doing direct investment, they're hiring professional fund managers. Right. 
And Pritzker Group 2 is a third generation, so you see them hiring professional teams, participating in the private equity and venture themselves, although JB, now that he's governor, has got a Chinese wall, but Tony's very involved. Um, and they've, they've moved on to other industries and in where their forebears created the wealth. So first generation, legacy focused, the business I know, the region I operate in, the circle of trusted parties I work with, second and third, beginning to evolve this professional team and, and, and need uh, more growth and, and, and being, being willing to go outside the family's uh, borders, if, if you will, right? Yeah, and, and what you're seeing is historically a lot of family offices would just put their money with the big banks. Um, so they would just outsource the whole thing. Right. Um, you'll, you've seen the last five years that they're bringing the management in house. Right. Uh, so that big trend. Managers, it's a huge change. Uh, so I think the statistics here were that the, the money going to hedge funds is coming down and the money being managed internally by the yeah. going up. So, a couple quick ones uh, age. So when you get members of the investment committee at a family who are family members and they are under 40 or they're in Gen Y, they may have different tendencies, proclivities, interests than folks that are baby boomers like me. How would you characterize this difference starting with you because you're a Gen Y? How is a younger family member decisioning and interest different from someone who's Say 55. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so exactly to you know to your point. Uh, my father is very focused in one particular industry with the mm -hmm. family. Uh, they have very trusted partners, and then not looking to go outside <coughs> the industry they know. You know, with uh, with myself, I'm looking to how do we create you know more impact investment. How do you look toward the future to you know my, my kids when they grow up? How how we can relate to them, and therefore changing you know the perspective, changing the trend into including a social impact and including to, um, you know, how do you connect with the younger generation for myself already, you know, I have a 13-year-old, so how do I raise him to be uh, up in the speed so he can, you know, be involved in the family business. So I have a question also for you that I've, that I've read that uh, in, um, in 2000, like, you know, a year ago, two years ago, uh, there, so there was uh, two new billionaires in China created every single week. <coughs> And then uh, when a lot of uh, family offices did their exits in China, they put the money into the new ventures, so the number of the family office grew from 50 to like almost 1,000 in less than two years. So that particular trend is more the younger generation, right? Uh, the wealth has been generated at different levels. So you have more traditional industries, the real estate, the infrastructure, um, where a lot of the money was generated five years ago. Uh, in the last few years, Yes, there's been a lot of younger billionaires uh, from the tech boom. Uh, the figures are distorted because up until this year, there was no real tax collection system in China. Uh, so uh, every business I've ever seen in China over the last 20 years has been loss making. Uh, uh, they either make a very small profit or they break even. Uh, so, and likewise, there's a lot of very wealthy people who are the figures you see for China, which are stunning, uh, they have the largest number of billionaires and millionaires on the planet, is a small fraction of the real wealth. So uh, there's a lot more old money, which is not on the records. But yes, there is new money as well. There are a lot of people in their 30s who make money from the tech boom. Uh, there'll be more and more of those because the tech boom is accelerating in China. Mm -hmm. So there is a shift in wealth towards the younger generation. Plus a lot of the older generation are dying. When China opened up in 1978, a lot of the money was made in the 80s. Those people were 20, 30 years old, now they're, they're retiring. Uh, that money is now getting passed down to the new generation. The new generation is not interested in the infrastructure and manufacturing. They want to go into the new technologies. Uh, and they're much, much more well Most of them are educated overseas. Uh, one of them actually overseas, so they're investing globally. But certainly, the trend towards the sustainability probably higher in China than it is over here. Because you feel the effects more acutely because and it's a bigger threat? Yeah, you open your curtains in the morning and you can see. I say, it's apparent. It's, it's very obvious to everybody. So No snow in Beijing this winter. No snow. <laughs> no snow and, uh, and no clean air. So, yeah. the, um, uh, so the people that sit in the same world, we may have $10 billion in the bank, 
but there are 20 million new cases of lung cancer in China every year. So if we're going to get lung cancer and die, what the hell is the point in dying rich? So uh, there is a, a very big emphasis on sustainability. So th this is key, I think. Uh, when interviewing or getting to know or building a conversation or relationship with a family office, you really got to get to what are their interests, what makes them tick, where are they going to remain interested, right? And find alignment. And secondly, I think as a GP, you've got to show that they're going to have influence with you, that you are a resource to them, and that you want an active, hands-on LP because they're going to make their own investments. Now, the one thing you can be confident of, if you're Charlie O'Donnell or you're Frank Caulfield, is they can't hire someone as good as you. They just can't, right? They might be lucky enough to have someone married to the family like Simon, so we're good. But you represent a field of knowledge and a tenacity as a professional investor that they would like to have. But you've got to make yourself transparent and available and a true partner. And I think this is, this is the sea change we're seeing amongst GPs. They're setting up co-investment programs. They're inviting their family offices to be active, recognizing this trend. But you gotta really get down to what are they interested in. You also have to understand that family offices are by their nature shy and private and don't want to reveal very much. So you've gotta be very skillful in asking these questions. You've really gotta be curious. So you gotta be transparent, curious, and, and find these places of alignment and you've got to set yourself up as a friend of the family, a resource, someone who's going to give them data, information, co-investments, invitations, et cetera. Do you, do you guys agree with that? Absolutely. And how do you see this played out badly or well when you talk to GPs? Uh, well, I think that you know, from the from the family office perspective, when we look into you know who do you work with, you obviously look at a track record and also you know with the names. But it's usually, I mean, it's everybody I know. It's really the one relationship. So you have to know either somebody who have worked with them in the past or somebody who isn't isn't that little family. And same thing goes to VCs. You know, to approach family offices are very private. It's very hard to find what deals they're working on, who they're investing in. Uh, it's uh, you want you know go to the website and figure out what they do. I mean I don't, I don't know anybody who would, who would. So it's really finding uh, people who know somebody in the family who have done their de deals in the past and finding out what is the nature of behavior. How do they operate? Do they go by trust? Do they go by the skill sets? Do they you know do like a lot of operation in house or do they outsource? You know like really get to know them and spend. You know, it's not trying to rush to the goal. It's even if it takes you a couple of years to really to get to know the family, to create a warm relationship, to be able to hang out with them socially, and only then approach them for a business perspective. That really is the best way to work with family office, to, to from my experience. Agreed. You said something yesterday that is, if you could get a meeting cold or with a weak intro today, but if you waited two months, you could get a warm intro from a trusted party. Run, you would always take the ladder, right? Absolutely. Always go in with the best warm intro you can. Um, yeah, I think. Um, yes. Go ahead, sir. I think that's important because if you are a family office, uh, you get bombarded by people sending deals every day. Right. Um, so I, I have an inbox uh, where everything goes, which I haven't looked at for about four years. Um, <laughs> like this, there'll be another thousand emails, um, and none of them will ever get looked at. So, you know, it's typically, we don't do real estate in the U.S., and, and we don't have much information on our webpage, but it does say we don't do real estate. Uh, and 80% of the emails that come to me say, I know you don't do real estate, but, um, which is a waste of everybody's time. So, if, if you're not going to do your homework, then don't even bother, because um, uh, we all get bombarded so many deals, uh, and unless they come from somebody we know, it's very unlikely we'll ever look at them. Uh, so you really do need the, the personal introduction or some kind of relationship. Or you need to be able to say, look, I saw you got involved in this deal, we have something similar. But it's really got to be something to hook the reader. Because uh, there's a, a family I work with in, in Hong Kong, um, and we were talking about how many emails we get, and she had had that day on Really? It was just a flashing around. Um, you know, we are 
people think they have a lot of emails they don't. Right. <laughs> right. So are there, are there questions are you, amongst the audience? Thanks so much for your time. I have a question. Please. Michael from Your Partners. Uh, it's often the case that family offices will shift their attention to a different segment or uh, or adjust their point of view around how the market is unfolding. It's important for GPs to go back and, and ask, hey, how's, how's the, the portfolio going? Where are you looking at opportunities today to assess fit? Because sometimes what doesn't fit yesterday or what doesn't fit today may fit in the next fund cycle. So um, you know, how often should we be checking in with, with you as we develop the relationship? I think it's content marketing 101, meaning you've got to produce content of value, not pablum, sure. not clickbait. Sure. For your family offices. And there's no point in sending them that quarterly update if two things aren't true. You haven't met them and been curious and established a relationship where you actually know something about them. And secondly, you're publishing information to them that they can't get anywhere else. And you're using your expertise, which they can't hire. I think those things are true. I don't know, why don't you guys add to that? How would you like, to, if, you, if you want to hear from somebody on a regular basis, What's the best form, Simon? Well, I think just specifically addressing that point, I think you're absolutely right that um, investment objectives change are much quicker than they do with a PE fund or a VC because when you go raise a, a seven-year fund and you set out the mandate, you're pretty much stuck with that um, because you've got a legal commitment to do that. Family offices are far more flexible. They can shift uh, in a 24-hour period if they see the market moving. So you're right that going back is uh, is worth it um, if you see that there's, they were you know doing something which is, is clearly dying then it's worth going back to them and saying that you now shift it. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of that uh, content, it really does need to be focused. I think if family offices want to do something like us, uh, we will go out and find the right people. So we're we're doing a lot more in healthcare now. This is a big healthcare opportunity. Three years ago, I didn't know anything about healthcare because we didn't. So I'm you know, part of the exam in Boston, and there's a lot of healthcare stuff here. So we will actively go out and find people as well. Um, but I'm not going to find everybody. Uh, so if there's somebody in healthcare, then that's great. They're welcome to, to contact us. Yeah. yeah, I would say that also, you know, do as much as research you can do before reaching out to the family office, especially if you see a new deal they're working on and something similar to what you do in approach. So it's more direct. And especially if you have a deal that you think will be interesting for family office that are time pressuring, then after sending an email, I would actually follow up with a phone call because if my emails were lost, I was like, hey, sorry, I'm coming up your time. Just shoot you an email. I think it'd be really interesting to take a look at it. If you're interested, give me a call. Something very short and so, so sweet uh, just to get attention because just email alone, 99% is going to get lost. Yeah. Uh, Soros calls uh, the VCs they like black belts. So be a black belt, right? Be the best in the world at what you do. And, and if it aligns with their interests, if it doesn't, you're wasting your time, right? So find alignment and be a black belt. Are there more questions? Charlie. Yeah, so uh, the family office world by design is not particularly transparent. And, right. And, you know, because if you put out there, hey, we have a bunch of money, that, you know, you get the amount. Any tips on manager for managers to vet the veracity of uh, people's connections uh, to family offices? If Lorraine Job shows up at my door, I know that she has money because mm -hmm. I'm aware of where that comes from. But uh, you know, I think a, a lot of folks have gotten inbound or follow up or conferences or whatever from folks where you literally cannot figure out if this person is legitimate or not, or they could be attached to a family office, but maybe they're just consulting on the side, they don't have direct uh, investment yeah. authority. How do you sort of figure out who's legit in this world? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm gonna just tease this apart a little bit. So, you, so first of all, you should assume everyone's a faker, and they have no discretion at all, until proven otherwise <laughs> at these conferences. <laughs> Secondly, um, Coupled with that is, I think what's needed as families really get into this is a way for families to disclose what are they interested in to trusted partners. We need a, a family office API, if you will. And that doesn't exist today, but when I brought that up to groups of families, they go, yeah, we, someone has to solve that problem. 
So you're a technologist, Charlie. Well, there are some platforms that say they do this. Yeah, yeah. But they're, having also been on the institution LP side, I know I never went on them because yeah. I never like wanted more deal flow. Right. So Creo does this in Impact, for example. That's legit, but there's a lot that are very narrow, right? But so in any case, how do you check out well, think, the people's bona fides? I think it just goes back to, you know, like we started from the beginning, is really finding out the people who you know, who you know people, to creating warm leads. We actually get a, we get a points of reference from them. Uh, or, you know, like, you know, you can get a lot in Google, but, you know, maybe there is, uh, uh, deal that you thought they were just going through it once, research that deal, you know. So you try, know, triangulate with another party, like who have you invested in, or who have you looked at, or who have you met with, mm -hmm. and eventually you'll get to somebody who can vouch for them being for real. Yep. It must be even more difficult in China if you're not an insider like you. Uh, if, if you're outside and looking into China, it's very difficult. Yeah. It's amazing to be um, But if you're within China, you know, most people difficult to fake in China because everybody knows who, who is doing what. Well. Should we, uh, GPs that invest either in, in American companies or global companies, be trying to attract uh, Chinese Well, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult, uh, particularly at the moment because there's uh, currency controls in place. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, technically illegal for Chinese to invest in financial products and funds outside China. Um, so right now is, is probably not the best time. Yeah. Uh, uh, depending on what happens with the trade war, that might change. Um, I mean, I think it's uh, vital that people look at China because uh, it will impact your portfolio companies. It's both a threat and an opportunity. And the Chinese look at the, uh, the U.S. the same way. Uh, they see it as, as opportunities and threats as well. So there is so much uh, synergy between the two economies uh, that uh, if you're only looking... I met an analyst who was a uh, Wall Street analyst covering Facebook. I said to him, so what do you think the impact of WeChat is? And he looked at me and said, what's WeChat? Uh, and I said, honestly, if you're working for me, you'll be unemployed. Yeah, uh, right. But I find that from right. all Americans. They have no idea what's happening in the second largest economy on the planet. Yeah, um, you, you said something the other day, is that we just really need to think about the world being a bilateral world, the United States and China. Yeah. And inevitably, the United States and China are going to find coexistence. And that's a trend to at least monitor. We have time for one more question. Laurel, I saw your hand was up. Do you have a good question? I was just curious. Uh, you guys were talking about co-investment programs that um, we could offer up uh, once uh, a family office was interested. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any interesting formulations of what a co-investment program, an attractive co-investment program might look like uh, that you guys have seen. Well, I'll take a stab at it. So we're a growth fund, so we're investing in C and later rounds, which are quite large. Even with our fund, we can't take the full capacity we see in each one. So where we have conviction, conviction and we're going all in in a fund position, there may be 10 or 20 million available to our LPs and to our LP friends, right? So we have our LPs in the fund get the first offer, and then uh, trusted parties like Natalia and Simon, now that we're buddies, if, the, if they're interested, they would also get invited into a data room. But what I think what's important is to have been publishing a rubric and a scorecard on how you look at deals so that you're starting to look at deals collectively from the same side of the table and through the same evaluative uh, rubric. So that's another thing we do in our co-investment program. Happy to talk more about it offline. Uh, guys, do you, do you welcome co-investments? Uh, is this something you do? Uh, we we some, some, sometimes do, but... Uh Oh, well, I mean, in the, in the oil and gas project, of course, you have to bring co-investors in a large scale yeah. because yeah. they're you know, multi-billion dollar projects and uh, nobody wants to write a check for the whole amount of it, even if they have money, but it's, it's going to be unheard of because you have a government oil and gas company participating, different family offices, and the idea is to diversify between uh, not only investors, but different nations and to different political systems as well so to have a more balanced uh, investor base in the big project. Um, but in just in general, we don't do real estate, but 60% uh, of all co-investment and family offices are done in commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the most common practice of co-investment would be the real estate. Yeah, we do a lot of partnership and co-investment um, because we do a lot of high-tech stuff where we just don't have the skills in-house. So we will normally bring in an industry partner in a lot of the deals we do just to rely on both the industry 
industry expertise and their distribution. So it's particularly important for us uh, because uh, China is a very fast evolving market. Technology is moving much quicker there than it is here. So there's a huge risk for us of picking up a technology which is, is two years out of date without us knowing. So yeah. we work very, very closely with a lot of the technology. Companies. All right, so we're going we're gonna to end it there, but I think you know, the lesson here is that families come from a tradition of co-investing and collaborating with other families. And so they want GPs that have that same kind of DNA. Um, we have many LPs now in our fund that start off in a co-investment with us that then came into the fund. So uh, the panelists will go outside for a few minutes in case you want to talk to them. There's an even better panel coming up next, so we're going to exit. Thank you for your time.